Washington, D.C. When 43 people walked to the fence surrounding the White House, they zip-tied themselves to the bars and patiently waited for the U.S. Park Police to arrest them. This was actually the day that I was arrested. I was arrested a few years earlier. Among them were seasoned environmentalists, social justice activists, millennials, climatologists, and Nebraska ranchers. They gathered in an act of civil disobedience against the Keystone XL uh, uh, pipeline that would carry oil derived from tar sands in Alberta, 2,700 kilometers to refineries in Texas. And it's shown by this, uh, this dotted line here. And actually part of it, though it doesn't really indicate it here, it would also be this stretch from uh, Oklahoma down to Houston. Since the pipeline would cross the United States-Canada border, the U.S. State Department and President Barack Obama had the authority to accept or deny the permit by the pipeline builder, TransCanada. The White House group included leading environmentalists as well as relatively lesser-known activists. Among them was arguably America's most popular and respected nature and environmental writer and co-founder of 350.org, a climate activist group. Beside McKibben was Michael Bruin, executive director of the Sierra Club and one of America's most venerable and oldest environmental groups. Just days earlier, Bruin had convinced the club's board to officially sanction this civil disobedience. And this was a very surprising turn of events since the Sierra Club was critical of earlier direct actions by McKibben and its allies. Nearby was Julian Bond, a leading civil rights activist and a co-founder of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a group that during the 1960s led freedom rides, lunch counter sit-ins, and co-organized the March on Washington. Bond stood arm in arm with the founder and president of the Hip Hop Caucus, Reverend Lennox Yearwood, an experienced climate campaigner and social justice activist. McKibben, Bruin, and Reverend and the groups they represented, 350.org, the Sierra Club, and the Hip Hop Caucus, had organized this sit-in as well as a much larger rally held on the National Mall a few days later. Others at the White House fence included James Hansen, one of the world's leading climatologists and director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. Amidst these better-known environmentalists, scientists, and activists were ordinary citizens, such as Randy Thompson, Sue Luby, and Abby Klein-Schmidt, three ranchers and farmers from Nebraska who had spent much of the past four years opposing attempts by TransCanada to build the Keystone XL across their land. There is also a sprinkling of celebrities, among them too, such as Daryl Hannah, star of the 80s comedy Splash, and as seen as having her Thomas Thurman and Kill Bill Volume 2. It actually turns out that Daryl Hannah is quite an environmental activist. She's sort of the Rachel Carson of Quentin Tarantino movies. So maybe you should give her a uh, Carson Fellowship here. <laughs> Collectively, this group of arrestees was a snapshot, in this case quite literally, not only of those opposing the oil pipeline, but of America's fledgling climate movement. The proposed Keystone XL pipeline drew the ire of climate activists beginning in 2011, when the climatologist Hansen called the pipeline, quote, a fuse to the biggest carbon bomb on the planet, and said if the tar sands in Alaska were fully developed, it would be, quote, game over for the climate. This phrase attracted the attention of McKibben and his supporters, who saw resistance against the pipeline as a way to rekindle spirits of American environmentalists, who in 2010 were despondent after the failure of the world's leaders to sign a binding agreement at Copenhagen, or the US Congress to pass cap and trade legislation, which ideally would have reduced greenhouse gas emissions. Making the Keystone XL uh, pipeline and fossil fuel tar sands extraction as the centerpiece of their efforts offered a way to focus the attention of climate activists on a tangible goal. In the process, this disparate group of activists forged alliances. They surmounted barriers between mainstream environmentalists and environmental justice activists, between progressives and rural conservatives. Barriers long hobbled climate organizing. In short, they built a coalition that convinced Obama to deny TransCanada's permit, which the president did in November 2015, making the pipeline the first major fossil fuel project scuttled in the United States because of concerns about climate change.
The campaign against the Keystone XL pipeline is among the most notable events and developments related to climate activism over the past half decade in the United States. These include resistance to fossil fuel extraction, transportation, and storage, like this uh, campaign in New York State. Fossil fuel divestment on university campuses, like this one at Stanford University. And the People's Climate March, <laughs> Stanford, go Stanford, uh, and the People's Climate March in 2014, where 300,000 people marched through the streets of Manhattan demanding government action on climate change. But I would say it was the campaign against the Keystone XL pipeline, perhaps more events and developments that helped forge the American climate movement. My analysis of, climate, of the climate movement is informed primarily by a flurry of recent scholarship on the history of American environmentalism. Work by Adam Rome, Frank Zelka, Michael Best, Paul Sabin, and Finus Dunaway have examined the institutions that led to the flourishing of environmental concern in the 1960s and 70s. And they have noted the profound influence of environmentalists during this period on American and European culture, politics, and institutions. Some of these writers, most notably Sabin in The Bet and Dunaway in Seeing Green, have started the movement's misfortunes since the 1980s. They tell a declensionist tale of a movement unable to significantly alter American policy or contend with the most vexing environmental issues of the day, particularly global warming. Political scientists as well have analyzed the failure of the US Congress to pass climate legislation, citing in particular the failure of the US um, uh, American environmentalists to overcome entrenched polarization between Democrats and, and Republicans, but more pointedly, the failure of environmentalists to organize the grassroots or to foster a climate movement. They echo the comments of historian Richard White, who 10 years ago called American environmentalism a movement in crisis. Even sympathetic critics of the movement regarded as ineffectual, demoralized, and unfocused, he said. Many politicians are afraid of gun owners and evangelical Christians. Few are afraid of environmentalists. <coughs> Together, these scholars paint environmentalism as an impotent force and climate change is an issue with low political salience for Americans. But clearly something has happened in the past few years as shown by the massive demonstrations in the United States, the divestment groups forming on college campuses, and the many groups resisting fuel extraction. So I would say to understand this change, we need to identify some of the persistent obstacles to building a movement um, and what has also prevented the building of a political coalition to address climate change. So what are some of these obstacles? So I'd like to identify what I'd say are some general obstacles and then talk about some persistent sources of divisions. And the first and most important obstacle has been climate change, skepticism, and denialism. As the, as the historian and Eric Conway have shown in their marvelous book, The Merchants of Doubt, there has been concerted effort over the past 30 years to foster doubt about the reality of climate change and the role of anthropogenic gases in causing it. These two historians, as well as other scholars, um, have shown the, have affirmed the role of, found, of funding by libertarian buildings billionaires such as the Koch brothers and uh, think tanks funded by the SCAFE Foundation. And more recently the role of what are called Republican super PACs and pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into campaigns to foster doubt about climate change. This has actually been an extremely successful uh, program. It has sown confusion about climate change among many Americans, especially conservatives, who are far more likely than other Americans to deny the reality of climate change and question whether people have any part of it. But what, but many, actually many other Americans do know about climate change and they accept the reality of the science, but they do nothing about it. And so the question is why? The sociologist Kari Norgard offers an explanation. She argues that when faced with the reality of climate change, people in affluent countries have three dominant emotional reactions. Guilt, fear, and helplessness. They feel guilt because as residents of industrialized countries, they realize they contribute to climate change through the energy they use and greenhouse gas emissions they produce. They experience fear as they worry about fiercer storms and rising seas, and they feel helplessness because climate change seems so big, so abstract, that nothing they will do will address the problem. <laughs> 
Guilt, fear, and helplessness are all disempowering emotions. And so if these are the feelings that are the awareness of climate change evokes in many Americans, it shouldn't surprise us at all that until recently many Americans haven't been manning barricades to pressure political leaders to address the problem. But what if Americans did want to do something about climate change? What would be their political avenue? Well, for the past three decades in the United States, the most common political outlet has been what is called consumer-based environmentalism. Scholars such as Ted Steinberg, Finus Dunaway, and Jenny Price, who was a Carson Fellow here a couple years ago, have critiqued this type of environmentalism for the misguided emphasis on individual consumer action to address environmental ills. Advocates of consumer-based environmentalism would say, well, we can cope with environmental problems by tweaking our consumer habits, buying green products, eating locally, and recycling. I would also say and argue that this is by and fault, by uh, default, the, the default environmentalism of, of the young. And this is less by my reading and scholarship, but more by teaching an introductory environmental course of 150 students at Syracuse University. Almost to a person, they are, if the extent to which they are environmentalist at all, they are consumer-based environmentalist. So in addition to these obstacles, I would say there are some persistent divisions in the United States that have made forming a coalition on climate change very difficult. And the most important of these divisions, that will probably be well known to some of you in the audience anyway, is the divisions between Republicans uh, and Democrats and that political polarization. Uh, political scientists tell us that the polarization in the U.S. Congress is the highest it's been since the 1870s. Not the 1970s, the 1870s. And that's not particularly encouraging because the 1870s were only a decade after Americans slaughtered each other by the tens of thousands during the Civil War. And the most polarizing issue in the United States that various uh, uh, polls show us is climate change. And this is on very stark display in the current uh, political election. I don't know if you've heard, there's actually a political election going on uh, in the United States. And both Trump and Ted Cruz, the two primary contenders, are stark climate change deniers. They're not skeptics, they are deniers. Okay. And then on the Democrat side, you have Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. They both acknowledge the reality of climate change, that humans have played a key role in it. And they've come up with a number of policy solutions to, to address it. So that is one very troubling division. But there is also a division between uh, mainstream environmentalists and environmental justice activists. Mainstream environmentalism in the United States is often seen correctly as white, middle to upper middle class, and concerned, at least until recently, primarily with protecting wilderness and endangered species. Versus, on the other hand, environmental justice activists, who are much more likely to be black, Latino, or Native American, and focus on the disproportionate siting of things such as toxic waste sites and other environmental harms in their communities. Environmental justice has a very different history than mainstream environmentalism. Environmental justice comes from the rights movement of the 1960s, among other sources. And environmental justice activists still critique mainstream environmental groups for their inattention to social issues and for the predominantly white and male leadership of these large organizations, such as the Sierra Club, Audubon Society, Wilderness Society, and so on. And the division is the division between environmentalists and rural whites who work in agriculture or extractive industries such as mining and logging. Many people in the rural United States who work in these sorts of industries see their opponents as environmentalists, who they often correctly note are often middle, upper middle class and live in suburban areas and cities. I would say these divisions have been very problematic because they have fostered distrust and even disdain between one side of this group and the other, particularly between Republicans and Democrats, who can often um, barely stand to be in the same room with, with uh, each other anymore in the United States. Now, I would say that creating a climate movement would entail finding ways to overcome these general obstacles and these persistent divisions to foster a new coalition for the 21st century. And so what I want to do with my remaining time is talk about what sorts of people and groups have joined the climate movement and how they, in often very different ways, have overcome the barriers I discussed. And so the first group uh, 
uh, that I've sort of uh, cited of the five groups I'm going to be talking about is what I would call disaffected environmentalists. And let me talk to you about some of the key figures in this group. It would include Gus Speth, who was the chief environmental advisor in uh, the President Carter's administration, and later the dean of the Yale School of Environmental Studies and Forest. It would include Mike Tidwell, a former journalist who became the founder and is the head of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network in Maryland. It would include Wen Stevenson, a former mainstream journalist uh, from Massachusetts who has become a full-time climate activist. Michael Bruin, who is still head of the Sierra Club, but has tried to move that club in a more radical direction. And most importantly, Bill McKibben, who I imagine, again, will be familiar to, to many of you. All of these in their, all of these men in their uh, writings and their speeches tell stories of disillusionment with business as usual environmentalism. A good example of this is after the failed 2009 climate conference, Bill McKibben writes about weeping in a Copenhagen cathedral because of the country's to reach an agreement at this time. And I think this quote by McKibben captures the disillusionment and dis his decision to chart a new path. I sense from the speeches I was giving and the email that flowed in hourly that people were ready for a deeper challenge. It was time to stop changing light bulbs and start changing systems. If we are going to shake things up, we need to use the power Martin Luther King had tapped. We need the power of direct action. We would need to go to jail. And I think the stories that Bill McKibben tells here and that these other disaffected environmentalists tell um, really illustrate that has developed between reform and more radical strands of environmentalism. And I think this is being very echoed up more broadly nationally that the tension that we're seeing between Bernie Sanders and Hillary uh, the Clinton, the, the very stark difference of opinion between radical and more reform uh, solution. So in some ways, the environmentalism, the debates we see in much environmentalism, we can see on a much broader scale in American politics. The second of this group in the coalition, some key figures in this, part of what I would call social justice activists. This would include Van Jones, a former community organizer from California, and had uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an environmental um, position in the Obama administration. It would include Julian Bond, who was a civil campaigner back in the 1960s and in the last years became involved in the climate movement. He actually passed away a year ago. And more, most importantly and interestingly, a man named Reverend Lennox Ewart, which I imagine many of you have not heard of. Now, Lennox Ewart and his group, the Hip Hop Caucus, uh, in the roughly, I don't know, eight years it's been around, has been involved mostly uh, with the African American community on Get Out the Vote campaigns, and so he's working closely with some of the most prominent hip-hop artists in the United States, particularly to get youth African Americans to come out and vote. His organization has also been involved in reality against African Americans, also focusing on the disproportionate number of, of blacks in America who are, who are incarcerated. But uh, Rev uh, Reverend Ewood grew up in Louisiana, and so he's made connections and has fought for people in that state in the wake of Hurricane Katrina to make sure the federal government came to help the affected communities there, who were mostly African American but not it, exclusively. Now, Reverend Ewood in particular, and he's become very involved in the climate movement and the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline. And it's very interesting the way that he talks about it, because he makes a lot of comparisons between the U.S. Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s uh, uh, and the, the climate movement of today. In an interview with me, Reverend Ewood made an explicit connection between the anti-Keystone XL pipeline campaign and a, a particular pivotal civil rights battle in Alabama during the 1960s. And he said, I think the pipeline became the Birmingham for the environmental movement. It became that symbol. If we can crush what's happening in Birmingham, in other words, the pipeline, then that will have a ripple effect on the other parts of the country and the world. Now, this shows one aspect of the climate movement really looking at other social justice struggles um, as inspiration, but also the climate movement has really taken a lot cues from more contemporary civil rights struggles, particularly the struggles of uh, the LGBT community. And this is an example of who were in the military in 2009 and 2010 who were fighting ask, don't tell policy in the United States that prevented gays and lesbians from serving openly in armed forces. 
Services. And one of the main people involved in this was a man named uh, uh, Dan Choi. When uh, environmentalists such as McKibben were parting and putting together their strategy of like how are we going to pose the pipeline, how are we going to civil disobedience actions, their main users were people in the LGBT community who were involved in this. So it shows an example of the environmental movement trying to forge alliances and connections with social justice struggles and use them as a model. Now the most prominent person I would say in the social justice activist wing of the coalition Naomi Klein, who will be familiar to probably all of you in the audience, who's a best-selling book, This Changes Capitalism Versus the Climate. And environmental humanities guru, Rob Nixon, who says that this is the most momentous and contentious environmental book since Silent Spring. That's quite a praise. So I guess that means we need to rename the Rachel Carson Center the Naomi Klein Center. So maybe after this talk, Chris Hoff can begin to work on that. Okay. Now, oops getting ahead of myself. Naomi Klein, like uh, many of these people who, who, these social justice activists, weren't necessarily involved in a lot of environmental struggles before they got involved in the climate movement. Naomi Klein is very upfront with this right in the beginning of her book. She's like, you know, environmental issues, I figured somebody else had that covered. And so a lot of these people move straight from social justice activism uh, into climate movement activism. And more than any other part of this coalition I'm talking about, uh, these social justice activists have infused the movement with the rhetoric of justice. So much so, often the climate movement is called the climate justice movement. Sometimes those two terms or phrases are used interchangeably. Now another important group, part of this coalition, the third of the five groups I'm talking about, uh, are millennials, or uh, a, a term we use particularly in the United States for Americans under the age of 30. And the youth have been pivotal in the climate movement. Um, and the role of youth more generally, I think right now, is greater today than at any time since the early 1970s and first birthday. Millennials formed the key leadership in 350.org, which is by far the most innovative and influential of the new climate groups that have formed in the U.S. over the past decade. And these are the founding seven members of 350.org in 2007. They were all students together at Middlebury College in Vermont. And they formed an intergenerational alliance with their environmental elder McKibben, who also taught at that college. Um, 350.org is very interesting and hopefully during the Q&A we can talk a little bit about them partly because um, their really innovative use of social media and activism that's very, been very important for them to reach other youth or other millennials generation. And they've developed a very distributive model of organizing that's not a very top-down, it's a very distributive model of, of organizing. So I'll just leave it there and maybe we can come back to it to the Q&A. Some of the Things that 350.org and other millennial activists have organized, organized Keystone XL uh, uh, Descent, White House, where 400 uh, youth were, were arrested protesting the Keystone Pipeline. They've also been in organizing fossil fuel divestment on college campuses that have sprung up all over college campuses. Syracuse University, where we have had a very vibrant uh, fossil fuel divestment movement, and they actually successfully convinced Syracuse University to divest its endowment from fossil fuels. At least for a while, we were the largest institution, at least the largest endowment of any institution in the world, to commit to divestment. And so this type of act, climate movement activism is occurring, occurring right on my campus. Millennials have also produced, for lack of a phrase, the first martyr of the climate movement, and that would be Tim De Christopher's. And Tim De Christopher's was arrested um, bidding illegally against an, an oil and gas lease in uh, Utah, and he was convicted of that and sentenced to two years in jail. And the main reason he came out and to be involved with that was because of his concern about climate change. And so he's become a spokesperson for the climate movement now that he's out of jail, talking about the need for more civil dis disobedience and more direct action. And so, and some of his, what he did is somewhat become a model for others in the climate movement. Now, the fourth group I'm actually not going to talk about much, uh, just for the sake of time, and these would be climatologists, and a very small subset of climatologists, prominent scientists who have entered the public arena. That would include James Hansen, who's been arrested five or six times, NASA Goddard, Institute for Space Studies, uh, Michael Mann, who's been subjected to really withering attacks by uh, Republicans, uh, and Catherine Hayhoe, who's a very interesting figure. Again, hopefully in the Q&A we can talk about her a little bit. 
She is an evangelical Christian and a climatologist, and so she served as a very important emissary between the scientific community to a group of people of faith, the evangelical community, who tend to be very skeptical of climate change. Uh, so hopefully we can come back to them in Q&A. Now the last of the coalition I'm going to talk about is what I would call state populist in the state of Nebraska. And in some ways they're the most interesting, in some ways the more, most radical um, of the climate movement coalition because it's an alliance between urban progressives in the big cities, in or relatively big cities in Nebraska, with ranchers and farmers in conservative areas, most notably um, rural Nebraska. And red states, for those of you who don't know, is just a colloquial term we use in the United States for areas that are dominated by, by Republican. Beginning in 2010, some in Nebraska began banding together to, to oppose this Keystone XL pipeline which would have crossed Nebraska and threatened the Ogallala Aquifer. So this is the state of Nebraska right here. Here is the original route of the pipeline, and here is the Ogallala Aquifer that underlies much of the state of Nebraska. Now, they opposed it primarily because of local threats to land and water, and as the threat the pipeline posed to private property. Uh, and members of this sub-coalition, if we can call it that, would include uh, a number women ranchers, farmers, and small business owners, such as these women that you see uh, here. I had the good fortune to interview um, all of these women, actually, when I was in Nebraska a couple years ago. Also, urban progressives and writers, such as Mary Pfeiffer. Um, and this is someone who's become very involved in climate activism in Nebraska and at Keystone XL Pipeline. But again, she has no experience in environmental activism. She's actually best known, known for a best-selling book she wrote in the early 90s about uh, the lives of adolescent um, women. The real leader of this movement in Nebraska uh, is a very dynamic individual named Jane Klepp. She is the founder of Bold Nebraska, which is, was a group that was created in 2010 to help foster grassroots progressive politics in Nebraska. And they were focusing, at least at the beginning, on health care reform, but they quickly turned to focusing on the Keystone XL pipeline and climate change. And Klepp saw a real opportunity to build alliances between urban liberals, such as herself, and, uh, and other progressives with rural Nebraskans, who tend to be very conservative and more likely to vote Republican. Kleb realized that the stories of ranchers and farmers defending their homes, land, and water from TransCanada, the pipeline builder, made for compelling stories. Also, like 350.org, Bold Nebraska proved to be very deft users of social, uh, social media. Now, your question, as good environmental humanists, might ask, like, what does this have to do with climate change? This doesn't sound like uh, this is about climate change at all. Well, one of the things that has happened over time with this alliance, as they fought the Keystone XL pipeline, they've made alliances with people outside the state, and many people they've made alliances with are people who are against the pipeline because of climate change. And so many of the people in Nebraska, they all kind of tell the story, you know, I came into this fight because I didn't want TransCanada to build this pipeline across my ranch more about how terrible tar sands extraction was in Alberta, and I learned about the problems with climate change, and that now kind of informs my resistance um, to it. So they formed this really interesting alliance. Also, Mother Nature played a, a role in this as well. There's a devastating heat wave and drought in 2012 had a horrible effect on the corn crop in Nebraska. And so, you know, when that was happening, climatologists were, I mean, it was in the news a lot saying, like, well, it's going to get a lot worse. This type of weather and types of drought we can expect in the future. And how is Nebraska corn farming going to survive that? So let me have, let me bring this to a close and talk about a few concluding remarks before we turn it over to the Q&A. I would say this is a story. This is a story about a relatively ineffectual environmental movement in the early 2000s that went through a process of transformation over the past half decade and has become a vibrant and somewhat more effective movement. And the somewhat is a key qualifier because I don't want to overstate what the climate movement has done in the United States over the past five or six years. And there are a number of points I think that we can take from this story. First and foremost is the denial of the Keystone X pipeline by the president shows the ability of the climate movement to overcome persistent obstacles that have hampered environmental organizing to address climate change in the United States. And it has done so by forging this interesting new coalition and also substituting feelings of guilt with anger. 
and feelings of helplessness with empowerment. A second point is that by and large, this new climate, these new climate activists reject the consumer-centered individual environmentalism that has been a hallmark of American environmentalism over the past 30 years. And it, they've substituted this for a much more adversarial politics of protest and civil disobedience. Third, the American movement has demonstrated an ability to work across scales. It is a true in my discipline of geography that successful social movements work across um, many scales. And the American climate movement has been able to successfully nationalize what were very local issues until against Keystone XL Pipeline was mostly a fight in places like Nebraska and also Texas and on some Native American reservations uh, in, the, in the Dakotas. And so the climate movement was able to nationalize that issue I think some very interesting ways. And that has actually been a problem for the environmental justice movement. Many of the people who are involved in environmental justice struggles have created ad hoc local groups. To this day, you know, 25 years after the environmental justice movement came on the scene, we don't have a large national environmental justice organization. A third point is that the American climate movement has, uh, a fourth point, excuse me, is this, this story shows the ascendancy of justice discourse in the climate movement. Um, it's played, placed justice at the center of its concerns, and by doing so, the climate movement has managed to blur many of the distinctions between the environmental justice movement and the mainstream environmental movement. And in doing so, they've created a movement as the writer and climate activist, Wen Stevenson, who I showed you earlier. They've created a movement that is less like environmentalism and more like the social struggles of, 19, of the 19th and 20th centuries. Finally, the American climate movement, despite a few exceptions, is mostly a movement of liberals in the left. I always make a joke about this with my students. If there was a Republican climate march back in 2014, they were lost. Okay? It's, it's basically a movement of liberals in the left. Um, um, the main exception to that has been Nebraska. So this is one of the few places where they were able to surmount this seemingly intractable political in the country. But now that the pipeline has basically been killed, at least by Obama, uh, it really remains to be seen whether this, this alliance that is formed in Nebraska between more conservative people and more liberal people will endure. And I think more broadly for the climate movement, it remains to be seen whether if they can't surmount that polarization between Democrats and Republicans in the United States, whether they can truly be a successful movement and really change uh, climate change policy in the United States for the better. That's it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.